Good. Okay. Welcome okay. everybody to the first day of the Virtual Roundtable Web Conference. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We're looking forward to the first of quite a number of workshops during this three days of an event at the Virtual Roundtable dedicated to language educators around the world on the topic of educational technology. And I'm very delighted that we have one of the stars of the English language teacher, teacher's world with us, not only because she's part of Business English Special Interest Group BASIC, um, she's also a, a fantastic teacher trainer when it comes to educational technology. And I've experienced Kirsten a number of times at conferences where she is truly a star when it comes to running an interactive workshop or even an interactive presentation. So we're looking forward to some real hands-on activities with Kirsten. Kirsten has been a business English trainer based in Germany since 1998, and she's taught in company courses for many years. Today, she focuses on teaching business communication, English for specific uh, spe special purposes and intercultural courses. She has designed her own material in this field and provides teacher training too. She's based in Bochum and uh, she is a wonderful, I mean, if you ever go to Scotland, if you are ever in Glasgow, make sure Kirsten is at home because you will have, you will have the best experience about Glasgow that you could ever think about, yeah? And she knows every whiskey out there and she can even tell you what the with she goes and she says, this is the one I want, this is the one I want. You are in best hands if you're in Glasgow. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Sorry for that. <laughs> Over to you, Kirsten. Thank you for doing okay. this workshop for us. Good. So um, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, Heike has been through this actually, all the arts, the museums, the whiskeys and the food actually. So but uh, Glasgow is a fantastic Very city. Very fond memories. <laughs> and I just can't wait for IATFL to go back there with the next conference. Good, um, okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. And do you yes, actually yes. see the PowerPoint? Good. So um, I already did a similar workshop. It's not gonna be the same workshop last year. And we also, of course, designed a course based on this in, in smaller units, because if you introduce ad tech tools, the biggest problem is you can't follow because the teacher knows everything about it. And you go like, stop, hold on. I can't listen that fast, exactly. So what we're gonna focus on today is, is especially the newer features, the more recent features, because Microsoft has been working like hell on Teams over the last couple of years. They changed a lot of the plans, they changed a lot of the apps and so on. So it's actually an even richer tool and I would say an even better argument to start using Microsoft for something more than just video conferencing. So before we dive deep into this, um, who of you already uses Microsoft Teams and in what way? Can you please um, use your arm, um, unmute yourself and just share. That's your first activity here. If you don't want to speak, please use the chat. Um, share um, your experience with Microsoft Teams. Never used before. You never used it before. Okay, no. good. Mm -hmm. Zainab also, okay. Good, Katya, Angelika, Heike, and I think there's another, hi Benjamin. Um, I think there was somebody else who just left again. I don't like this when people leave me. So what is your experience with Teams then? We just use it as a conference tool or contact tool for a home office. Okay, no. good. So you use already the chat function a lot, I yes. would say. Good. Chat and um, calendar and yeah. Where do you work, Katja? Bundessprachenamt, Köln. Okay. Hürth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the federal language office. We have <laughs> things in Germany which are fantastic. Yeah. Like okay. That. By the way, Kirsten, I guess we studied together at the Ruhr Universität Bochum. It might be. It might be. I finished in 1993. The chat function. Well. Yeah. So I... hi Marina, you're back. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, 
We discuss that later, Katya, after the yes, workshop. Absolutely. Good. Okay. So Jim, Benjamin, and Marina, hello there. Um, what is your experience with Microsoft Teams so far? You can use the chat or you can just speak. That's up to you. Uh, well, yeah. I don't use Teams a, a huge amount. Um, okay. Tends to not tends to not work very well on my computer for some reason. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, oh, um, I can well. tell you why that is. Okay. What computer do you have? Mac or PC? Uh, MacBook. Yeah. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Jim. What is it with you? Uh, I'm a big believer in Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good. Angelica says in the chat she uses it on a regular basis. Uh, Marina, what about you? Uh, also on a regular basis because it's a platform uh, during pandemic uh, classes at our university. Okay. Yeah. Good. So because this is what happened, universities, institutes like the Federal Language Office, so public institutes, but also companies made a decision at some point, and a lot of companies, universities, and so on decided for Zoom, others decided for WebEx, and a lot of decided for Teams. And those who decided for Teams didn't do this because it's the better conferencing tool. It's not. I also work with Zoom. I also work with WebEx. I'm happy with them all. But they give you so much more, starting with, for example, this extensive chat function that's also, ava also available to you outside meetings um, and does not disappear. And that's actually already quite a good one. Yeah. So that's basically Great what question. we look at. Heike, yes? This question just because I'm directing people to sign up at Canvas. Is that necessary at this point at all? No. Or shall we do it at the end of the session? We can do it at the end, I think. That makes more yeah. sense. I can say something about that. Yeah. Then please yeah. focus back on Kirsten's presentation here. Apologies for sending you into Canvas. And uh, we'll do this at the end. You can catch up with her recordings in Canvas in the learning management system um, once again. So over yeah. to you, Kirsten. Sorry. OK. So, and depending on where you work, you will uh, see that Teams comes in different licenses. So universities and schools usually buy an educational license, which gives you a lot more features. For example, you can automatically integrate a class notebook where everybody can collaborate and those kind of things. So that's already included in this educational license. And as long as people have the address of your university or school, you all belong to one organization, which makes a lot of the features easier because Teams is actually designed for closed organizations. And at the moment, they are widening the communication tools to integrate external people, which makes it easier for people like me because I am my organization. So everybody who's invited by me is already external and we still have some limitations. Um, Microsoft changed its plans. If you want to go there as a freelancer, not as a member of a university or school. So uh, what used to be Office 365 is now Microsoft 365. So we have the business basic, which gives you, which gives you teams one terabyte of cloud space and the online version of Office for something like six or seven euros a month. And then you have business standard, which gives you the full version of Office, Teams, the webinar function, um, apps like Stream, which is the video editing suite, um, and everything like the SharePoint and Yammer and all of this. And that is something I think I pay, that's what I have, I pay something like 40 euros a month. Compare that to other systems, and that's not only this video conferencing tool, you get the whole LMS. Uh, so Microsoft can afford that. And I have an almost unlimited number of users. So that's quite good. Microsoft Teams, contrary to what people tell you, is actually also compatible with uh, Linux and Mac OS operating systems. But Mac OS isn't very happy with Teams. So you need to configure a lot of changes. So that's the, the point here. I think Benjamin mentioned that to get it run on um, Mac OS. So you have to um, give Teams access to a lot of things that MacOS doesn't do automatically. So some, so like when you want to connect the camera, and that can be actually quite frustrating in the beginning, but there's a very nice link. There are two articles um, that uh, I have copied here. So um, when we upload this, um, I think they should also be available. And they are really very good if you want to understand what can be difficult running Teams on a Mac, Benjamin. So that's the... Um, 
how to get the better experience and also like uh, how to install Microsoft and uh, Teams on a Mac system. But I think the biggest problem is really Microsoft Teams is a cloud-based system. And that means it eats up all the bandwidth that you have. And I think that can sometimes be a problem because it just needs a lot of things running in the processes in the background. And maybe that's sometimes why it can be a bit slow on a computer. So that's actually um, the biggest problem at the moment that I have with this. Um, in Germany, we have, or in the EU, we have, of course, the general data protection rules. And Microsoft also finally made sure that all these rules are met, which, is, which was a bit, big argument against it, that a lot of companies said it doesn't follow data protection rules. But according to them, they do now. So that's a bit of a background um, if you think about starting using Microsoft Teams. As educators, teachers, trainers, coaches, whatever you do, um, there are a number of functions that you can use Microsoft Teams for. So instead of having 10 different apps and sending tons of emails, you create the team, you create the class, and then you just work from one platform. And for me, this is the, actually the beauty of Teams because it's the one and all. It doesn't look like it, but it is. So um, I picked a few things from the course because we can't do the whole course in something like 40 minutes or something. And I want you to uh, ask questions and uh, comment on things and something like this. So I picked a few of these things that um, I think um, teachers can really benefit from. Hi, Elizabeth. That's nice, nice to have you back. So we're going to build on what I told you last year. And we're going to build on what's in the course, but we're going to do it with a slightly different angle. So what teachers need to know in Teams is actually how can I set up and how can I manage a course? But this is something you can do from the beginning to the end. Then I want to assign tasks to my students. Yeah, how do I do this? And how do I make sure that they do the task? Because team also, Teams also offers a tracking tool here. Then Remember, you are getting one terabyte of cloud space. How do I manage my content? Where do I find it? How can I organize it? So that's um, a very important function. And Teams um, also allows you to add apps, special functions to your different courses so that students can use these apps for learning tools as well, which is for me actually one of the most important ones. It's actually easy to handle, but it can be a bit overwhelming because there's something like 2000 apps and you have no idea which ones you need. And finally, but I think that's something most of you are possibly familiar with if you use the video conferencing tool. It is also very useful to understand what tools do I have in Teams to facilitate group work. Good, we're a small group. So um, which of these? Use the chat box, please so that we can really dive in deeper, make it more interactive. Which of these five things would you be most interested in? Limit yourself to three if you say all five, fine. But what would be most interesting for you? Put it in the chat. OK, three to five. So more the advanced part. Mm -hmm. Okay, number five, the group work. Adding apps, so that's number four, good. Zainab says number two, the, the tasks. Also the group work, Marina, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Giselle says the same, good. Okay, good. So then we just um, do the other ones a bit more quickly, but we are going to do them. Okay, so what you can, what you should be able to see here is my team's surface. Can you all see that? Okay, so, and you see here, I have a number of courses, for example, uh, private lessons with people, but also my academic writing groups, other writing skills or something like this. Huh? So basically to set up a, a course, all you do is you create a team. So you click on team. Uh, so you say join or create a team. And you have different ways to create a team. So you can create a team from scratch. Then you start with nothing. Uh, but you can also cre uh, create a team from another group or team. This is very useful. For example, I did academic writing too. So what did I do? 
I cloned academic writing one because um, a lot of the elements that I need to teach academic writing, a wiki, a pre-course question and so on are the same. So I could just clone this. So I can do this from a group or team. But if you're not quite sure what your course is going to look like, you want to keep things simple, you can also select the templates. So maybe it's going to be more like an event that you want to manage or um, you're going to click on the template for onboarding employees because it has a lot to do with teaching. And then you see you get already different channels, announcements, employee chat training and the general one that's always there. And they already put some apps, milestones, for example, power tasks, which is a very important app, a wiki and bulletins. And then you can just start from there. So it's really that simple. All you do is then you click next, you click finish the course and you add people to the course. That's your students. And this is actually by making them a member. Uh, so we have here a demo team. And when I click on this, bop, bop, I click on the three dots. So I can just say add member and then I can add any email address that I want to. And I can just add the person. Yeah, so something like this. And then basically the person receives an invitation. They have to accept the invitation. And there's a little trick. You see this here at the top, my tailored trainings. This is my environment. If I'm invited to other teams, I have other teams environments, for example, the University of Budapest, the Chamber of Commerce in Dusseldorf and so on. To activate them, I have to click on the invitation and quite often I have to leave Teams completely and then restart Teams so that Teams establishes these guest environments. That's quite important because your students need to know that because they might not see the new environment the first time, depending on their settings. But that is also something you can explain usually in the first session or help them do that. And then you can actually move between different or they can move between different team environments. So that's basically what you need to know if you want to set up a course. OK, are there any questions on that? So anything you tried before you go like, I have no idea if it worked or I'm not sure if I did this right. Okay, good. Uh, so, um, so basically you start a course from scratch or template. That's what I've just shown. You recycle the content, you manage the team, you register people as a guest member. Uh, so that's basically the invite that you get, Kirsten added you to the demo team, and then you say open Microsoft Teams, and then it will actually edit the new environment. Uh, so um, that's basically the most important thing. The second wonderful thing is that, uh, of course, you can set up meetings in Outlook on your calendar app. But Teams has its own app to do that, which is what we call the channel calendar. So in my Teams surface, we go to the demo team, because that's why it's called demo team for a very good reason, as you might guess. You go to the general channel, and then you see here the demo team lessons. So this is basically the channel app. I added, to, I added the channel app, renamed it. So whenever I put in lessons, I can just say add a new event, make it a serious event or something like this. So whenever I, um, they have this, all of my students are automatically notified. So the moment I create a new event, then everybody, you see this here, everybody in the demo team gets already the invitation, the changes and everything. So you don't have to send an email or something like this to 25 people. Everybody gets it as long as they're enlisted in the team. And that is actually, a, so you also have a scheduling assistant and so on. Now, so you just change it, edit, type details, click send and everybody gets this. So this is actually quite nice and other learning management systems offer that too. So that's already a criteria because learning management systems are not there to make your life more complicated. They are there to simplify your life. If you need 20 hours to learn a learning management system, you've got the wrong LMS. So I know this, I spent 20 years on Moodle, but I use Moodle with so many different institutions that I finally thought it's worth it. Now, so um, Teams is actually a lot easier to handle. So that's what you do. So you set up your um, environment there, you set up your lessons there and so on. 
And that's also quite easy. And then basically you're already done. You've got your course members, you've got your course name, you got your basic course structure and you got your course participants. So that's already basically the first part you can do. So um, that's the wrong bit, that's the wrong presentation. So that's what we have. I yeah, see the lessons appointment and so on. And you can of course make it a recurrent meeting and everything. So that's pretty easy. Huh? The people then receive also a chat. A lot of people said we used the chat. You will also be informed via the chat that I've set up lessons appointments every Monday until this and this date. No? So that's basically quite nice. And whenever I add a new app or new tab at the beginning at the top of the course, people are already informed that I made some changes to the course. Now, so it's also a very transparent LMS. Good. So that was already part one. That was five minutes. That was good. Good. Um, but this is not where we start. This is just a basic course structure. Of course, we want to interact with our students. So we think about how can we assign and track tasks. And you have two ways to do this. You can work with a bucket, a bucket list. I think that's the real meaning of the bucket list. Or you can actually work with channels to design learning stations. Are you familiar with the concept of learning stations? Do you have any idea what, what a learning station is? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Heike mentioned in the beginning that I teach uh, business English. So for example, um, my students need to learn emailing. Now you think about emailing, what would be the first block of knowledge that people need to understand about emails? When you learn how to write emails, what, what do you start with? Okay, etiquette. Yeah. For example, they say, okay, so what makes a good email? Etiquette. Or I could say how to address people in an email. Mm -hmm. I could talk about the style, Marina, very good, which is very close, forms of salutation and so on. What would be the, the second step? So let's just call it uh, email etiquette and addressing people. So what would be the second step? What comes after? You understand what's the best style, how to address people, and etiquette. The structure. Good. How do I structure um, the email? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah, I can talk about formal and informal email writing and so on. And these would be learning stations. So when I have my teams, then I have these uh, channels. So I can say, I want to create a new channel and I want to say email etiquette. That's what I do, right? So, and then I can say, okay, I want everybody to show this. I can say everybody has access or only specific people in the team have access. Yeah? So I can just add this and this would be my first learning station. So, and then when I have here email etiquette, I add my files. Uh, so everything I upload, some PDF, some Word documents, something I want my students to work with, I upload here. So I can put all the email, uh, all the materials about um, email etiquette, uh, style, addressing people or something like this here. I just upload this as a file. Good. So, and that's the first thing. So everybody can see that that's the first learning station. Then I create another channel. Uh, is that uh, structuring an email? So, so I can add the description. Yeah, so this is where you learn how to structure an email, how to hit the right tone and what, whatever. And I can also say everybody in the team has address, has access to this. So add the channel. And now comes the trick. I don't want my students to start working on structuring email before they have completed the tasks in email etiquette. What do I do? I hide the channel. So you just hide it. So it's no longer visible to students. So this is a great way. You can prepare your whole content and don't just clone the course later with the content. You can prepare your whole content uh, 
I think that was one of the questions I think Elizabeth asked last year. Is there a way to do that? You can prepare the whole content, put it in the different channels and hide the channels. And only those people who have completed channel one, the email etiquette, get access to channel two. So you can say no longer everybody has access, only those people I put in there because they have already started with a channel. Okay, Giselle says, is channel similar to a module? You can make it like this. You can also uh, use it as a discussion or project group for your students, but using it as a kind of module is one way to use a channel, yes. So that's one, so that's one of the two things and you can create as many channels as you want. So that's pretty easy. Yeah. So, and then I have two hidden channels and that's something that's quite useful. So I can already prepare my, my learning content. So I don't have to do this every week. And then basically I just have to activate certain contents. So if everybody finished email etiquette, then I just go to structuring email. I say, show the course. It's no longer italic. It's no longer hidden. And then people can start working with the content in structuring email. So, and that is how you can use channels to create learning stations. Okay, what questions do you have on that? Giselle, did I answer your question, by the way? Yeah, she's, she's uh, accidentally replied in direct message. Thank you. Yeah, yes. that's fine. Yes, thanks. <laughs> yeah, okay. So the, I um, also take the thumbs up as a yes. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Can I just ask, um, does it make sense to join your demo team? Um, Not I, would need, I think you are already a member of this because that's yeah, the demo team we also last used year, last yeah. year. And I would have to invite everybody via email. Yeah, so um, that would take ah, some time okay. to activate the process because as I said, everybody then gets this notification, has to reactivate and so on. Um, but if people are interested in this, then they can send me their email via direct message and I can do it after the workshop if they want to, to see it for themselves. But basically Thank I think you. the PowerPoint explains everything because I took so many screenshots. I think that's the easiest once you start on this. Okay, are there Hi. any questions so on the learning station? So is that clear what you can do with the channel here? Okay, good. So then we just have a quick look. So that's basically with a PowerPoint. Good. Now we move on to the other function, which is of course um, using the, the tabs and the apps in the course to uh, organize course content. And I should say something about the apps. This is just one screenshot. When you go to the apps function in Teams, you go like, oh my God, I didn't even know so many apps existed. Neither did I. Yeah? So the most important thing I would really recommend here is be very careful and make a plan what kind of apps do you use and do you really need. So um, the good thing about Teams is a lot of the apps come already with Teams because they're done by Microsoft. So you have Forms, which is very similar. I think they just stole it basically, which is very similar to Google Forms. So if you know how to work with Google Forms, you can use Forms to set up a questionnaire or a feedback sheet for your course. That's very easy. Um, you have Praise, which is also quite nice so students can add positive feedback during the course, at the end of the course. Um, you have Polly. Polly is actually a polling tool, which is quite nice. And you have this, I already explained that, the channel calendar to set up your appointments. Yeah, and then you have the tasks planner, which I explain in a minute. Um, and uh, lists, for example, which is also a very nice app and so on. And um, you can also uh, search by categories. So for example, education app, productivity app, or something like this by certain industries and so on. But it's really important that you make a list of what you really want because otherwise you end up with 20 apps that you don't need. So select carefully. Good. So one of these apps then is actually the planner. And I show this in the screenshot first because it's a bit easier to use. So once you install Planner, you can rename the app. In our case, we call it Assignments. And the Planner assigns things in buckets. So um, I'm gonna show you uh, how to do this. So you have, for example, a preparation bucket and a homework bucket. And within each bucket, you can assign the tasks. So you can also give them the name of the Moodle uh, of the module that you're working in or something like this. And of course, you can also add this app to every channel. 
So if you want students to work on emails, you can add it to the general channel if it's a short course or to every channel in the app. So, um, so basically in our demo course, it looks like this. Um, dup, dup, dup. So I have here the assignments. You click on assignments. And in this case, you have the task, for example, email writing. Yeah? So I can just click on add a task, give it a new name, set a due date. Yeah? So let's just say uh, etiquette for email etiquette set a due date. So my students have to finish this by, let's say, end of next week. Uh, assign people. So you can see this is all the, so Heike is already there. So I could just assign Heike, yeah, and some other people who are like myself who are guests on this. And then I can just click on add tasks. So this is as easy. You can describe the task, of course. Yeah, so you go to, to etiquette. And then you see here, you can describe, you can go for some notes. So you can describe the task in more detail. It's very easy. You can copy a text from a task you have already prepared in a Word file or in a PDF. You can um, add a checklist. You can add an attachment. So if they need to describe a picture, your students, or they need to read a text, you can add the attachment here. And um, when people, and you can also add comments and you can also track students. So that's basically how you design a task in Teams. And the, t the task will stay there forever unless you delete it. So it will also move if you clone the course. So then you can also see completed tasks. So of course, the first task I do with my students is they have to complete a questionnaire. So I can see that like some people completed the questionnaire and then I can go on this. Yeah, I can uh, check this priority important. And um, in the SharePoint, when I go to the SharePoint, so I can also then go, but that's in the materials, I can go and look at the answers. So same right sentences about your job. So that's for example, in the homework. Yeah? And then um, I get a notification from Teams that people have completed the task. When I click on the notification, it leads me to my SharePoint and I can view and give feedback on their specific task. And if you want to have a new group of tasks, you just add a new bucket. Ah, so you say, uh, okay, question, something like question this. Question yeah. from Giselle. Yeah. The attachments, is there any limitation as regards file extension? That's a good question. What would you like to add, Giselle? Like a URL or what? The add attachment. Uh, any file extension works as adding attachment? Um, just we click on it. So basically, when you click on, you can go uh, from your computer. You can also add this from your Teams files if you have to already uh, store them. So basically, but when I go to, let's say, um, my course documents, I've never had any problems with that. So I could just say, okay, I want to add any PDF. Um, let's just take a picture. Any PDF, add attachment. It doesn't make any difference. It can be an Excel file, whatever. Yeah. So and you see this here um, when I add this. Um, and it's a picture, there is already a preview. You see this here? So people can already see what the picture is or what the task is about. So I don't think there are any, um, there are any really restrictions to this. Yeah. So, and if in doubt, you can also use a URL to a video or something like this um, and something like that. So I don't really think there are any, any restrictions. So something like that. And uh, so that's actually pretty easy. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that already helps students to understand and of course it incites students to do the task. Oh, that's a nice picture. What are we going to do with it? Yeah, um, it's the same when you add files, which is what I do a lot, of course. Um, so, for example, we have specific files like the learning styles quiz. And what I did was I basically pinned this. So if I have important files, I want my students to read like the course handout or the course presentation, I can show you this better in academic writing, actually. Um, then what I do is that, um, so I go to the course documents, and then you can see here that the handout that they have to download is already pinned. So if I have 20 documents in the file, then uh, you don't have to go through all the documents. You find the most important documents at the top. Okay. and. Um, Okay, you can't fight praise. Why not? That's a good question. Let's have a look. 
There it is. Angelica, why can't you not find it? So basically, if you search for an app, Angelica, I please explain. Yes, I see it when you, uh, I tried to redo that in my uh, mm -hmm. teams and I couldn't find praise. It isn't offered. Um, so the, I'm wondering which kind of apps are showed when. Okay, um, there can always be restrictions by your company or your organization that they say they don't, they don't want certain apps or something like this. Uh, so that can be a problem. But basically, you can search for apps and you can also change the language. So praise should actually be there because it's a Microsoft app. Mm -hmm. uh, um, show gratitude for your peers and then more for Microsoft. And then you can just say, OK, I want to try this. I want to open this. Yeah. And then you see what happens. Microsoft doesn't like reloading at the moment. So sometimes it does this. But um, yeah, so, um, so it's not on the suggestions like popular on Teams or anywhere. Until now, I'll, I'll keep on. I, I'll we'll go on trying. <laughs> yeah. So the, um, if you have the categories, try Microsoft, and it should come up in this list here somewhere. Yeah. But basically, okay. you can um, search can you, for can you every. Try to um, lobe up. Um, ah, it's lobe. Yeah. Lobe. I ah, so you have the German app. version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Great, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I was searching for praise. <laughs> yeah. Um, Didn't know that it's uh, translated. You can change Thanks. the. You can change also the language setting of your teams, but then it might be that the name of the app actually changes. Yeah, yeah, it does. So something like this. Okay, so we're talking about the German lobe or something like this. Can we track who opened uh, the files? Yes, Giselle, indeed we can. Let me go back to my teams and show you. So, um, da, da, da. so for example, um, yeah. so oh yeah, that's a good example. So for example, I can see who uploaded the file. Yeah, in this case, that was one of my students. He uploaded an image. But here, it is always the person who last modified, so who last edit this. Yeah? So I do see this, and when people make changes in a file, then I very often, I can also set it that I get a chat message. Yeah? So this person, yeah, that I know, but I can go to activities. Yeah, so I have this, for example, in activities that um, people said, okay, um, they uploaded something or they edited something. So yes, I do keep a track record of uh, if people actually do what they should do. That's true. Good. Okay, so that's basically um, this, and that's quite useful. And this is basically also the tabs. So what I did, of course, for my teams was um, I thought about what apps do they need? And in Wikipedia, in, in academic writing, for example, we work a lot with Wiki. So you can see like we have to clarify things like a thesis statement or people want to upload uh, information about special software or journal or how to write abstracts. And this is actually nicer with the um, Wiki because it's just very easy to do this. The lists, or the link list, the lists, the app lists, listen is also very useful because if you have, for example, links that you think are helpful for your students, you can put them there and add a description and then they can just click on this and everybody can edit this. Yeah? So you're the organizer, but in the teams, everybody has the right to do so. Good. But most of you were interested in number four and number five, which is, of course, the apps and facilitating teamwork. Um, but these tools are already very good for facilitating teamwork. So you need to understand them. So let's move on to those. So this is basically what you have in the PowerPoint again. So you can read up on it. You can see that you got the right screenshots. And this is also where you track students work. Yeah, so I get uh, information about that, um, if people have done their homework or not. Um, one tip here is actually check your notification settings, because you only get notifications if you activate the notification settings. So you have to say customized for teams and channels for all activities so that you are really notified when your students change something. Now, if you do a lot of courses, it can be a bit overwhelming, but that's uh, quite useful. Good. So we already said then that channels, and this is also a part of group work and facilitating group work, is useful if I want to manage content. But I work a lot with peer-to-peer -peer feedback or with project groups. 
And this is also something I can use channels for. Yeah? So for example, my peer-to-peer -peer feedback groups, you can see these are closed groups, so they're not open to everyone. They are only open to the people I add personally to the group. So the others cannot see what this project group or that peer-to-peer -peer feedback group is writing or doing. They have their own chat, so they can give each other feedback. You as the owner of the team can always check on the feedback. You can see if they behave, if they're right in a nice way and so on. And they have their own meet button. So if the project work says, oh, we need a meeting, we have to discuss this in person, not in the chat, they just click on the meet button and they start the meeting spontaneously. And I don't have to be there. So I don't have to open a room for them. So this is also something where channels are incredibly useful for um, collaborating group work. Uh, so, um, so you just set up the channel and then you don't say standard, but just like private specific team members have access and then you actually uh, decide who's going to be in which group. Yeah, the meet, yeah, the meet function is great. Before teams had breakout rooms, that was the only way to, to put people into smaller groups. But I still use them sometimes if I have full day workshops, then I give them a one hour break and say, go into your channels, go into your groups and work on this for one hour and then come back to the main meeting. It's a much nicer atmosphere then. And it's not as stressful as being in a breakout room. Um, so it's actually a bit easier to handle sometimes. Good. Uh, so that's basically what they have. Um, okay, so the content library, um, I think we're going to skip that bit, read it up and do the uh, activities that we have in the course, because that's very, very complex. Um, but with your teams comes the SharePoint. So everything you have in teams is actually stored on the cloud on the SharePoint. So that means um, the Teams is only the user surface, it's stored on the SharePoint. And this is then also where everybody can upload. And this is especially useful if you have large files like videos and so on, and students just click on it and then it connects to the SharePoint in the cloud. Uh, so this is basically your SharePoint document library. You can search for special document libraries. And you can also set up specific libraries so you can collect all your audio files in one library, or you can have different um, team websites. So that's actually also quite nice. This is what we already discussed, so we can skip that because that's the different levels, the learning stations. Good. The apps. So as already uh, demonstrated by Angelica, you need to make sure that you search for the right app and the right name. But there's some really nice features about the apps. So the apps you find here in the bottom left corner of Teams. And you click on the apps. So, and then you already see that um, we have here the featured apps, best-selling topics, popular. Of course, Microsoft wants to make money. We have the categories. So like educational apps, we'll clap. That's actually a new one. YouTube, of course, you can type in YouTube directly. Yeah, um, apps for math. You have Mentimeter. Um, does any one of you work with a Mentimeter? That's a very popular app among teachers when they do webinars. So in the beginning to get an, uh, to get this, uh, Kahoot is there. So you can just tie in Kahoot as an app. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of these very famous apps, and if you have your own license, fine. But very often they're licensed through Microsoft. So you can just add them, like Quizlet or something, and use them. And that's Quizlet is here, and that's already quite useful. Also Prezi Video or Flipgrid, which is great for audio recordings. So you can already uh, check which educational apps are there, which of these do I already know, and which of these do I want to use. Uh, same for image and video galleries, or for example, project management tools, if you teach more in that area. Yeah, so you have Confluence, you have Jira, you have OneNote, you have all the big names there, basically, and they all offer an interface to make them accessible through Teams. So basically, you don't leave the platform, you just access this through Teams, and that makes life easy. What if you want to use an app that's not available yet? Well, you tell Microsoft about it, you manage your apps, and you have two options. You can, if you have admin rights, upload an app to your organization's app catalog. So if you have university or school individual apps that are not for use outside, you can still upload them in your organization's environment. Uh, 
or you can submit an app to your org. If you say, oh, I found this great app, but it's not in Teams yet, talk to your admin and they can upload the app for you. So you're not restricted necessarily to the apps that are offered through Microsoft already. So you can actually upload your own. You can search for apps. So for example, whiteboard apps. I know a lot of people work with Miro. Who of you knows Miro or Miro? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then you can just say, okay, you can see if there's a Miro and then you can just say, okay, I want to add Miro. I want to open this. You get a teaching video if you're not familiar with the app. So you can see if this app is really for me, then you can open it, you can link it, publisher it, test it and everything. Yeah, and use um, Microsoft, so, and it shows you here also how Miro interacts with Teams. So again, very easy, very easy to self-teach you on apps. And for most apps, you get this kind of like um, explanation first. Then you can also see, okay, how easy is it for me and my students to use, okay? So, and then the apps, when you go back to your Teams, uh, the apps can either turn up here. Yeah, so you see these are the apps that I constantly use. And you can add the app to the menu of every course. So that's also very easy. You just click on create, add a tab, search for Miro. If it works, add Miro, click on add, and then Miro just turns up at the top. Well, so that's basically how it works. So it's actually quite user friendly. Good. So, yeah, and um, for example, um, Heike started here chat already in email etiquette, when to best use this expression. I trust this email finds you well. And then you can say, okay, that's the discussion task. And then everybody can reply to it. And you already have a group interaction. So you can use the chat also for as a discussion forum, not only to inform people about classes or something like this. So that's also actually very easy. Yeah, and then you can already see, okay, um, maybe you want Kahoot, you want other apps or something. So they also suggest already certain apps if they realize you use this as a course room. Good. Uh, so that's basically what you can do with the apps and think about the apps you really need. Okay, so there's also a lot of information about apps. Um, so really spend a couple of hours on this. It takes a lot of time, but it's really worth it. And that's basically what I've just shown you. Uh, so I use, for example, Flipgrid and Poly, and that's very nice. You can also add a whiteboard. Microsoft Teams does have a whiteboard, but warning, spoiler alert, the whiteboard isn't for externals. The whiteboard works within your organization very well. They, it, they did a lot of new, nice new things. This is the whiteboard these days. So you have your reactions, you can put photos in and all these wonderful interactive tools to work in groups, but it only works within one organization. If your team members are external, they get this nice little message, somebody else is whiteboarding and soon you can do that too. So far, it's not there yet. So, but I'll let you know when it is. And therefore you need whiteboard apps, like for example, Miro. Um, if you work or if you record meetings. Do you have, do you have a, a good example for whiteboarding? Because I never know when to use it really because Every app has it, like Zoom has it, everyone mm -hmm. has it. And um, yeah. but I show you one it? example. Um, I show you one example from another course, which is actually Zoom. So I think Jim will be very pleased about that. Um, so where I give them uh, a language suitcase and then we activate the whiteboard function and then ha they have to write the words. And let me have a look. We need one example. And they actually start brainstorming the vocabulary. That's for great for brainstorming. And this is then what the board looks like. And that's all the input. At some point I stop it, I take a picture, put in the screenshot, stop the whiteboard function. And then they start clustering. Okay, so which words go together? Which words form groups? How would you learn this vocabulary? Oh, it's adjectives. Oh, it's activities, what you do at the beginning or end of a journey and so on. And that's basically what we use whiteboard for. Um, so it's, it's very good for brainstorming. You can also give them a picture and everybody just writes down what they see in the picture. Because a lot of people don't like speaking in a course, especially not in the beginning. So it's a great way to stimulate the brain and to foster a vocabulary uh, production. So that's what I do with a whiteboard, for example. Okay, good. Um, so we are in, duh, duh, duh. 
that's my presentation. I didn't want that one. Good. So now um, one thing about the new feature. So Microsoft now has different ways of presentation mode. And they're also pretty good for learning content. So if you want to record your classes, you can actually choose the live presentation and put yourself in front of your slides so that you don't have this kind of little window box any longer. So that's quite nice. Um, yeah, so you know how to share this. And you can also use so and you can also use PowerPoint Live. So from PowerPoint, you have to function present in Teams. And then you get actually your uh, presenter view. So you see all the slides, you can see the notes and everything, but your students can see that too. And that each of your students can move through the presentation individually without changing or disturbing the others. This is huge. You need really a very, very good computer system for that. But it's great for the students because if they missed a bit or if they didn't understand a slide or an activity, they can actually go back to that slide and read it again. They can also have the slide translated. And we tried the translation function for German English. It works pretty well, at least in a way that students understand the content if the language level isn't so good. So they can actually have it translated into their own language. So that's PowerPoint Live. That's one of the latest features they added last year. And that's actually quite nice. And that takes us to the last part, because that's also a good way to facilitate group work, especially at different levels. What can we do about collaboration? OK, so of course, we have the collaboration channels. This is what I just explained. Channels can be public or private. You can ass assign them, and then they're only visible to assigned users. And the host, that's you, is always a member of all channels. So they're very good for collaboration. So because the students can work together offline, so you can use the chat function, they can upload a file and say, hey, give me feedback, and the other people give feedback in the chat. Um, they can create and review files and documents. So you open the Word document in Teams, click on the reviewing function, and then you just work on it like a Word document. Yeah? And they can, of course, share information and give feedback. Good. The good thing is you can always, you're always in control. So you can remove and add participants. You can move participants between groups. And as I said, there's the chat and the camera function. Um, channels at the moment are only available to team members. So if you have guest users, like a guest teacher or something like this, and they're not a team member, they cannot access the channels, but Microsoft is also working on this, they promise. The other thing that I like a lot with smaller groups, but also with bigger groups is the together mode something I cannot demonstrate because we're in Zoom, but you have the option when you start a meeting for large gallery and you can click on the together mode and you have this cinema uh, theater, you have a classroom, you have a university lecture hall as a background, and then people appear in the same room. And this is actually quite nice because you see your students differently, they feel differently. This was actually taken during the Microsoft Ignite where they went for this. Yeah, so you can activate your students to do that. Um, Teams also gives you the function to use subtitles. So if you teach in English, but not everybody is great at English, you can have the subtitles so your speech appears on the screen and the students, if they have the right version of Teams and the function activated, can read what you said. Um, I think Zoom does this now too, but it's still in a kind of trial stage, but that's actually quite useful. And of course, you can also transcribe the meeting as a meeting record later. That's a quite new function, so I'm not really sure how stable that is yet. <coughs> And of course, and this is something where they really improved a lot, um, Microsoft finally came up in 2020 with the breakout rooms. And I think in the beginning, it wasn't really easy, but now I think they're quite stable. They'd still take longer to set up and to create than in Zoom, but they're pretty stable and people can also work with this. And the chat is a bit easier to handle yeah, because you, you can monitor in your teams, the chat of all the groups. So um, it's pretty simple. You create the breakout rooms, and I say automatically or manual assignment, and then you have the different rooms. Like in Zoom, you can rename the rooms like Jersey and Berlin and so on. You can move people, you can assign people to different rooms and so on. So you can say, okay, uh, I want these people now to, to go to another room or something like this. And like in Zoom, you can also make announcements. It's still missing the timer function. So when you close the rooms, it closes the rooms directly. There's no 60 second countdown. Uh, 
No? So that's something like this. What is quite good if you work for a, another school is you get um, an attendance report. Yeah, so that's quite nice. So for the class attendance, you get an attendance report and that's automatically created at the uh, end of the session. So let me just have a look in, it doesn't do the chat right now, right? Okay, so I can't demonstrate this, I'm sorry. Um, so, but normally when you go then to the chat or group chat, you would also see the group chat of the different breakout rooms. And you can do this also live. So you can open the Teams chat and then you have an overview of what every room does without entering the room. So this is what you still have to do in, in, in Zoom, of course. But if you are in Teams, you say, okay, put your sentences um, into the chat box. Um, it's really a pity that this doesn't work. Put your sentences into the chat box. Um, yeah, so you see here you have room one and room two and you can view this live and then you get basically what they have been writing in the room, you see what you have been posting into the room, and you would also get this for room two. And you can also do this live while you're monitoring the room, so you see this and you say okay I want to see what room one or room two is writing, so you have also a better control of how your students do the group work in the individual rooms and if they do the group work at all, so this is also actually very useful um, to do that. Yeah, so that's basically um, what we had a look in the workshop I hope that I was able to focus on the things that you were interested in, and I think. Unless Heike cuts us off, there's still some time for, for questions or any comments from your end. Thank you very much. I believe take some questions, if that's okay. Still have time. Uh, the following session would have been a break, so we can still uh, do just another five minutes or so. Okay, sure. Take... Okay. There's first of all a lot of thank yous. People have, oh, oh my God, it's over. Yes. So. Can you tell me one thing what the students, I mean, how do the students feel about um, MS Teams as such? Are they, well, they love happy it. with it? Yeah. 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 Um, with my academic writing classes, um, I think, um, so the, the, the university uses Teams, but more for chats and, and video conferencing. So they've never been to a Teams. And so the first two sessions were always like, how do I find this? How do I set up on this up on my Mac? But once they see how the collaboration works and how easy it is to upload their own homework and everything, they just love this. So, and um, most of them find it easier to use than more complex systems like, like Moodle, for example. And also with, um, I have a couple of more groups where I do this with, and um, they just like the room, the room work. And that um, I can later just show them what they have written and we discuss this together and everything. They really like the interaction a lot. Yeah. Um, can you also explain one thing of puzzle that always puzzles me with teams is, is the notes, the one notes. They mm -hmm. seem to be not inside that whole structure of things. Um, yeah, you can add a one note as an app, basically. Uh -huh. So um, we've got a hold on, we got a slide somewhere, but I think I just uh, I possibly re deleted this from this part here. So of course you can add one note as an app, so that's possible. If you have the education version, if it, it automatically comes with that function because you have special education notebooks that you can use for class collaboration. But let me just see if I have the other presentation somewhere. But it is no problem actually, because I think I deleted this from this one because I thought that's too much. Um, but yes, you can just um, add OneNote as an app and then you, uh, people can open the OneNote notebook through Teams, that does work. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, we're also collaborating on MS Teams every so often, but for some reason, we're forever looking for our documents. <laughs> I don't ah, know. Yeah. You, yeah. That, that's basically where you really need to have a better file uh, organization. And I would also recommend very, very strongly that you uh, start adding folders. I have one team where the files store everything you put into the chat as well. So if people upload documents in the chat, they're stored in the files, but they're never organized. So what you should do then is basically what we did for academic writing, for example, you create folders. 
So you click on new and then you say new folder, give it a name and then you move all your files there. So you need some person to do that, to organize this. And when new files come up, then you just add them to the special folder. So that's basically mm -hmm. okay. how you can organize that better. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. this is still something that you need to um, every so often. Some yeah, kind of unless yeah. Uh, you add OneNote. So you add OneNote and then you can also add a specific notebook and share it with everybody and everybody puts their ideas in the notebook. So these are my notebooks. So I could just say, okay, I want to add the notebook virtual teams. Okay. And then this is available and um, I can share this with everybody on the team and then everybody can put their ideas here. That's it. Can put ideas and documents there? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah sure. Whatever you do with a, with a OneNote. Yeah. So you can say insert, you can say upload, yeah, file, picture. So OneNote looks like Teams, but it has all the OneNote functions in Teams. That's no problem. Yeah? So you can also say, I want to open OneNote in browser to have it more comfortable, make it look like OneNote. But you can just say, I want to insert a file. Yeah, the attachment. I want to insert a picture okay. from file. So it's the same as OneNote. It's just OneNote in Teams. It's the different surface, but the function behind it is identical. The mm -hmm. same with Word. I have spell check and grammar check and everything in uh, the, the Word through Teams. So that's not a problem. Yeah. So you just have to share, uh, you have to add one out and then share the notebook that you want to use in your Teams. And that's all. Okay. Angelica so that's Heike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, want to know, I want to know what you recommend to when you work together in one document. Mm -hmm. with several people because i've tried that with wiki and it doesn't seem to work okay you upload the document yeah and um in this case uh, so we have for example um something that's called shared homework and um my students are very very hesitant about that so um i make sure the reviewing function is enabled because editing just means when people edit, you don't see who's made the changes. And um, then people usually leave comments. I would say edit the reviewing function so that people see who made the changes. In this case, it's myself, so I don't see this. And uh, ask people to use the comments more if they want to work in a document. Because I find that a lot of my colleagues find it very confusing if you have so many comments and uh, crossed out and struck through text and underlined text and colored text in the same document. What you can also do is when, when it's uploaded in Teams, you open this in the desktop apps, you open this in Word. You can close it here. And then you go to Word and I just hope my computer survives. So come on. Yeah, just have to move Word here. So, and then you can actually edit this in Word, which is a lot more comfortable for people. But when you save it, um, so for example, I cl just click on copy by and see this. You see this here, it, sh it stores this on your SharePoint drive in the same group. It is the same document, even though you access this through Word. So this can also be very helpful. The worst thing what people usually do is they download and then save the document in, under another name and that's not collaborating. This is why it start on the SharePoint and then people can really access the same document as long as they make sure that they don't rename it and they don't change, um, save it anywhere else. So that's actually pretty com and, uh, comfortable now. Do you get uh, confused where your docu documents are stored if it's on one drive or in MS Teams? No, because it, um, I'm quite clearly told where it is. So it tells me you stored this in Teams, in this team, in this folder. Um, mm. So it's not on my OneDrive, it's on the SharePoint. So this is not my OneDrive, this is another part of my Cloud Drive. Uh -huh. uh, so that's actually, so that's, uh, so that's basically everything. Um, so you really have, let me have a look if I got this. I think I have a picture of this somewhere, but in another file. Um, um, here we are. Sorry, this isn't German. You have to live with this, but I think I have a picture of this. 
So, um, so I'm happy, Heike, if you want this to, to put the OneNote back in. I think we have a picture somewhere where we see the library. That's where's my content management. Ah, okay, no. So, but yeah, basically uh, you see this then um, in your SharePoint that um, your SharePoint organizes everything for each team. I can put a screenshot of this in at some point. So it really organizes everything in each team. So when you open your SharePoint for teams, you see then um, all the different teams and open, all the activities. How do you open the SharePoint? I mean, it's yeah. Is, is it your look. MS Teams or? Um, no, you, you log into your Office account. I just see if I can do this without my computer crashing. Um, I, I never do that. <laughs> I think yeah, then you understand what uh, how this works. God. SharePoint. So, and so basically, when you log into your um, own Microsoft, mm -hmm, okay. and um, you click on the nine dots, which gives you the apps, and you go to your SharePoint then this is basically where you see how Microsoft organizes your teams for you. These are my teams. Wow. Fossil writing skills, academic group. So, wow. and it tells me, I'm sorry, this is in German. This is what I did four minutes ago. This is the file I uploaded. So this is your team tracker. Yeah? Wow. So this is also where you can copy things from one team to another and so on. And you have a check of whatever everybody ever did in that team and you have all the documents there. So this is what it looks like. So I'm quite glad That's that it amazing. works because um, this is actually a very good um, thing. I just have to change the language back to English before I take the screenshot. Yeah? And um, so when we go into, um, let's say the demo team. Yeah. Yeah, then it also says, okay, a lot of people filled in this uh, pre-course questionnaire. So you can see these are all my activities. This is what I just uploaded a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we have the video library. We have the general uh, thing. We have the appointments. We have the learning styles quiz. So everything I ever did here, including all the folders, are actually there. If and you delete you, them, you also you delete them in the Teams. Where would you see that I left a comment about... 15 minutes ago in the um, So I think I can see my activities, but usually I can also see other people's activity. But, um, so I think you need to go to conversations and then you have to, so that takes usually a while, but then you would have like the conversations via Outlook. That's what I don't like, so we stop that. But I think you usually can just, um, see what you did but i'm also pretty sure that you can see what other people uh, what other people uploaded i wrote in the uh, email etiquette yeah. channel yeah i wrote just um, a comment saying so when do you actually use uh, i trust this email finds you well you know yeah. when do you yeah then um so then i need to go like to that specific chat but even that is actually stored, but it takes usually Microsoft a while to, to, to open this. So I don't want to spend more time on this. Um, but basically, so you have a good track also what you did. So you see this here, for example, uh, you have here general in the demo team, and then you have uh, here that somebody modified that channel. Now, so that's somebody else, and I can see what I can open it and see what the people uploaded or changed. So that's actually quite useful. Um, but it also gives you a wonderful overview in these discrete units that you see whatever what you have in each team. So that's actually pretty useful. And that's actually where um, people often uh, see that this gives them additional benefit. And now you're under documents, you're not under channel, are you? Or is it the same? Uh, okay. No, but documents. I don't want to like yeah. um, uh, throw the questions at you at this point. So these are like the if different I'm the channels. Only one asking. <laughs> no, um, you're right. So, the, for example, we have the general channel, and these are then the different channels that we created. Yeah. So you can also use this, for example, to upload the documents, and then you can see them in Teams later. If you yeah. say that's faster with a drag and drop, if I have this, yeah, or something like this, and that's not my OneDrive. So my OneDrive is um, another part of this. Because you know, no. um, it seems. So my OneDrive is here. It so seems that's another that, app. Um, 
this old way of working together, which is like um, me and Angelica, we work a lot together and we, we use basically our documents to start working around the documents. But here it seems to be that it's the conversations or the channels that you have to start with. No, uh, no. Yeah, I'm no, not because, sure no. because mm, as I said, really, because if you open the document in Teams, then you can edit everything into the document like the comments and everything. So that's just like working together in Word. Now, so that's what I just showed with that one file where everybody oh, can okay. access and review and edit the file. So that's oh. fine. That's just like um, if you're sharing a Word file via OneDrive mm -hmm. and then everybody edits this one file and you can also share this via Teams. It's the same function. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank okay, you. good. Angelica, right. do you still have a question? Or no, I'll, I'll, I just just think of how we change our work, yeah. uh, our working together. Yeah. Um, I think in three years, I won't be doing this any longer because then everybody knows. I yeah. think this is, uh, this is one of the big game changers in the way uh, we work together, especially since um, work, working from home in the Corona pandemic, uh, because people just realize they don't have to be in the office any longer if they have tools that they can use to share and this also makes our teaching life easier because we 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 save a lot of paper a lot of photocopying we can just copy paste things and clone things into a new team into a new course recycle things and um, you save a lot once you learned it you say it saves you a lot of time would you even recommend say for example at the moment we're using um video hosting platform we're using canvas we're using uh, this to to sort of um to to change over to teams uh in one in possibly in one year unless you have one organization um because at the moment it's not made for people from different organizations mm. it works best within one organization or with smaller groups uh, so yeah. i think that's something where we still have to say okay give it like another half year or year when they have really developed something that you can use. But within organizations, I know universities use it instead of Moodle, it does work. Um, but I think we need a bit more time to make it more stable and accessible to everyone. And this is so the issue about Microsoft. And, uh, yeah. A lot of schools are saying, look, they get, um, not Microsoft, they get uh, Minecraft for the kids. Yeah? yeah. And the kids are working happily within the organization. But if they want to join another school uh, yeah. two kilometers down the road, they can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the same here. You would have to get a different Teams account. It's not so easy to transfer unless you have these guest accounts as I do. And I can happily move between my different accounts. Yes, so that's possible actually. Uh, okay. But uh, then you just get different contents. You cannot take your Minecraft over. That's a bit more complicated. Yeah. Okay, Giselle also said, can you access or grade the chat discussions? Yes. So I can actually say, uh, if people chatted in the room, I can say, okay, your discussion was very good. The language you used was very appropriate. And then you can actually grade that with a comment or something like this, if you want to. Yeah. I don't think there's a grade book really, um, you, but you can possibly find an app like praise or assessment forms or something like this that can also help you to grade. With the activities, with the task, you can actually grade during the comments and something like this. Uh, but I think you would need a special app for this if you want to have a grade book. Mm -hmm. Okay, lovely. Thank Good, you. then I would say you, you were so, so patient. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> so, Awesome. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Good. So I hope yeah, you find that useful. And um, as I said, so we did the course. The course is available in Canvas. Have a look at the course. Stop the video. Um, the videos are quite long. And once we have the shorter re-edited videos, I think it will be more interesting. But really stop yeah, the video and reenact everything in the course. So that's the course. Um, Heike posted I'm sitting the there beginning. waiting for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So good. I actually have dinner now because that's my dinner time. But I thank you very much for your, your questions and your comments and for your interest. Have a good evening. I thank you very much. You're wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.